No, no, no. You can see it is fine. I mean, you have, you know, some way of doing, calculating the determinant. Tell me a, tell me a way to calculate the determinant. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Yeah. How do you calculate a determinant? Huh? Okay, so you're talking about cofactor expansion, which everybody from class nine onwards know. Can you tell me any other way? You can zero out the elements. That's cofactor. Any other way? What do you think the determinant is? That is after you have done all these things. Yes. What is the determinant? You know? Suppose you have a 3 cross 3 matrix. What's the determinant? Any idea? You know what are permutation matrices? They are ones, one, one and all zeros in every row and every column. How many permutation matrices do you think there are for this? Okay. And now if you just look at this, this is that first term that you get when you do a expansion. So all you are doing is you are taking all the possible permutation matrices, put them as masks, whatever elements you get, you take their product. Yeah, and they come with plus or minus signs depending upon the sign of the permutation. Is that okay? Yeah. And now if you have a, triang a triangular matrix, yeah, apart from the, the basic permutation, all the other permutation will have at least one zero element. Think about it. Okay. Yeah, determinant is nothing but you take all the permutations, you put them as masks. You put this mask, you will get this element, this element and this element, take their product. You put this mask, you will get these three elements, take their product. Put this mask, you will get these three elements, take their product. Yeah, and each permutation matrix has a sign. Of course, if you don't take the sign, you just take the products and add them up, you get what is called a permanent. Yeah. If you take the signs, then you get determinant. If you take just the product and add them up, you get a permanent. Is that okay? Yeah? All right. <coughs> Enough of. Okay. So... If one can convert A into B, which is upper triangular, then we would have got all the eigenvalues. Yeah, And if you can do this by using similarity transforms. Okay? And what similarity transforms? Not just anything, but use similarity transforms where P is unitary. Okay, now the problem is which P to use and of course there is also a basic problem, is it possible to convert A to B? Is it possible given any A, so given any A in 
which is n cross n matrix, is it possible to find a unitary matrix P such that P star A B P is equal to B is upper triangular? Yeah. So this is possible and it's called Schur's lemma. For any A, it is possible to find P unitary such that How will you prove it? We will use induction. Yeah? If n is equal to 1, there is nothing to show. Okay, let's assume this is true for k minus 1. Okay, that means any k minus 1 cross k minus 1 matrix you can find a piece as that this is done. Okay, we will assume for k minus 1 and we'll show for k. Okay, so you take A which is a k cross k matrix and you take a eigenvector <coughs> yeah, take eigenvector of a <coughs> is it possible to find eigenvector of a yeah, with c and so you will have uh, as many eigenvalues as you got n so since you got an eigenvalue you will have an eigenvector so how many eigenvectors <laughs> it, doesn't In the be, it doesn't have to be. It could be not, they cannot be the same. But you will get at least one. The point is, you will get at least one. Yeah, but it could be. It will not be one case. Sorry. We have not made any statement about A. We haven't assumed A is semi-simple or anything like that. This is true for any matrix A. Okay. But even under the worst case, that means it's a it's it's a bad matrix. It has one huge Jordan block. There would still be one eigenvector. Okay. So we will assume we pick that eigenvector, and we will assume that the norm of this is one. Okay. Now, if you have a vector and you have taken its norm to be 1, then it is possible to extend that into a matrix which is unitary. Okay. This itself is not a, a priori clear thing, but one way to see it is this vector is one vector you take a basis yeah with this vector as the first vector you take a basis and then you do orthogonalization and you'll finally end up with this okay you take v and extend it to a basis of cn and then orthogonalize it and then normalize Okay, so you will get this. So we will use this as P. Then what is P star AP equal to? I claim this is going to look like this lambda something C. This will be all zeros and something else which I call A1.
Okay? Now, why is this true? I'll use that splitting of P. So, I think of this as V, W, A, and then here I have conjugate transpose, W conjugate transpose. <coughs> okay? So, A times V is lambda V. And then V, v conjugate on that, V conjugate B is 1, therefore you will get lambda. Is that okay? A times V is lambda V and W star acting on V is what? It's the, this is 0. Yeah, therefore W star A V is W star lambda V which is 0. Therefore this is 0 of the resulting matrix. The rest of it we don't care. Is that okay? The rest we don't care. So using this P you have converted this into this form where this column apart from the first element are all zeros <coughs> and now you look at this a1 which is a k minus 1 cross k minus 1 matrix yeah we have already assumed that this can be converted using similarity transform into a upper triangular once you make a1 into upper triangular what you're left with is lambda c and here now you have upper triangular matrix and this is all zero. So the resulting matrix is upper triangular. Okay? That's the proof of Shoes lemma. Is that fine? All put together. Yeah. So, this A1, we have already assumed that this A1 can be converted into a triangular matrix, let us say, using some P1. Yeah, but this P1 is a, N, a K minus 1 cross K minus 1 matrix. So, this can be made into T. That is, this is this triangular matrix. So, the final P is going to be V, W, uh, and then that is followed by 1, 0, 0, P1. This is the final P which will do it. Okay? Yeah? What happened? Is it fine? Okay. But when you do similarity transforms, that means A is converted to P star A P, that's, that's what we mean by similarity transform. Then there may be properties of matrices which are conserved. Yeah. For example, if A is a Hermitian matrix, Hermitian matrix, which means A is equal to A conjugate transpose, yeah, then when you do a similarity transform on A using unitary matrices, then the resulting matrix is also Hermitian. Is that okay? Yeah? Uh, for example, if you use A, which is skew Hermitian, which means A is equal to minus A conjugate transpose. So, this is the definition for skew Hermitian. So, if A is skew Hermitian, then when you do a similarity transform, 
the resulting matrix you get B is also skew Hermitian. Yeah? I hope it's clear. I mean, you don't have to work this out, I hope. Yeah, if A satisfies this property, then B will also satisfy this property. Okay? Um, if A is um, unitary, so if A is unitary, what's the property? A conjugate transpose A is equal to identity. So if A is unitary and you do a similarity transform using unitary matrices, you will end up with a B which is also unitary. Okay? So these are properties of matrices which are conserved under similarity transforms using unitary matrices. Okay? Now, Schur's lemma actually lets us conclude several things about such matrices. Okay? So, Schur's lemma tells us, given any matrix A, you can find some unitary matrix such that the resulting transformation and the resulting matrix is an upper triangular matrix. Now, suppose you started out with an A which was Hermitian. Yeah? And then you do these transforms, you will end up with a B which is upper triangular and which is Hermitian. Okay? Now, what kind of a matrix B can be upper triangular and Hermitian? Has to be real, the okay. It has to be diagonal. First of all, it has to be diagonal. Yes. Is that okay? <coughs> yeah, it has to be diagonal. In addition, we are also doing conjugation, therefore, it has to be real. Is that fine? Okay, so this observation gives us what's called the spectral theorem for Hermitian matrices. Now, the spectral theorem for Hermitian matrices essentially says that if you have an A which is a Hermitian matrix, you can find a unitary matrix such that this is equal to D diagonal matrix. Okay? And we are calling it spectral theorem because not only is this a diagonal matrix, but because this D will also be a Hermitian matrix, we also know every element is every element is a real number. So what we can conclude as a corollary is that all eigenvalues of Hermitian matrices, all eigenvalues of Hermitian matrices are real. <laughs> I do not know. Okay? Is that fine? Now, of course, we took Hermitian matrices. We can take skew Hermitian matrices. Yeah? If you take skew Hermitian matrices and you make use of Schur lemma, you will end up with an upper triangular matrix which is skew Hermitian. When can you get an upper triangular matrix which is skew Hermitian? Only diagonal and all, this, all of them must be matched. Is that fine? First of all, it will have to be diagonal. Yeah, because if there is something upper diagonal, when you take conjugate transpose, it becomes lower diagonal. And then you have to equate them, therefore it must be zero. So it has to be diagonal. Yeah? And then this A must be equal to minus A conjugate. Therefore, what are the complex numbers whose conjugate are exactly their negatives? They are the purely imaginary conjugate 
purely imaginary numbers. Okay? 3i conjugate is minus 3i. Okay? So if you start with a skew Hermitian matrix, then you can have a spectral theorem for skew Hermitian matrices, which essentially tells you, or the corollary, that all eigenvalues are purely imaginary. Okay? Now, in the earlier case, you had a you had a unitary matrix such that the similarity transform gave you a diagonal matrix. In case of skew Hermitian also it gave you a diagonal matrix. So now one could ask the inverse question that when is it possible to get a diagonal matrix? Given a A, when can you do a unitary transformation to get a diagonal matrix? Of course, one simple result would be if A is <coughs> semi-simple. Yeah, if A is semi-simple, then you can do it. Why? It's almost what it means. Huh? It's almost the same. Semi-simple and diagonalizable. Semi-simple and diagonalizable. Well. Yes and no, yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, I think you should solve these as exercises. I'll just tell you what sort of matrices can be converted into a diagonal matrix. Yeah. By, okay, there's a catch here. By unitary transformations transformations involving unitary similarity transforms involving unitary matrices okay so all matrices a such that there exists okay there exists p such that p star a p is diagonal such matrices are what are called normal matrices. And how does one identify normal matrices? Well, it turns out normal matrices are those matrices where A, A conjugate is equal to A conjugate A. That means the product of A with A conjugate, <coughs> yeah is independent of order. Okay. Now, this is a property. So, normal matrices are the ones which can be diagonalized or using unitary transformations. And uh, what are examples of normal matrices? Well, for one, unitary, unitary matrices because the product is equal to identity. Yeah. Hermitian matrices, because for Hermitian matrices, A conjugate is equal to A. Therefore, this product is equal to A squared, which is true here. Skew Hermitian matrices and so on. So, any matrix which satisfies this property is called a normal matrix. <coughs> normal matrices are precisely the ones which can be diagonalized using unitary transformations. Sorry? Does that exhaust or do we have more examples of normal matrices which are none of these? Which are none of these? Yeah. Oh, well, you can construct them. Uh, for example, if you now restrict yourself to, if you restrict yourself to real symmetric matrices, yeah, they are really a subclass of yeah. Hermitian matrices. Yeah. Yeah. Um, My question is, does it exhaust all the possible normal matrices? No, no, it doesn't. Uh, Wait. Uh, skew. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you can okay. you can give a property. Okay. So so you can take a matrix like this. 
which is 0, identity, minus identity, 0. Okay, and then you can define, I mean, identity could have different sizes, it does not matter, or same size, it does not matter. And then you can take matrices such that A, J is equal to J, A. Okay, or conjugate. Okay, or minus. Okay, now, uh, For example, A conjugate A equal to identity, which we call as the unitary matrices, it is really a group where what you are really having is I A A conjugate is equal to I. Instead, you could have J, J A, J, this will form a group. Okay. You can take J's which have very special structures and it gives you special. So, for example, this leads to what is called the symplectic group and so on. So, there are, there are lots of matrices that can, yeah. So, for uh, those who do signal processing, this is how the J spectral factorization and all come along. Yeah. Or for all the control people, this is passivity. You could also use identity minus identity and then you have small gain theorem. Okay? All of them are in the same class. Okay. All these matrices have the property J squared equal to identity, but anyway, or minus identity, plus or minus identity. This J is J squared is minus identity. Yeah, but that's anyway. Okay. So now we know that uh, using Shu's lemma, we know that somehow there is some unitary matrix by which you can get a upper diagonal matrix. Yeah. But so far we have only been restricting ourselves to complex matrices. What is the situation with real matrices? Okay. Now, it turns out in the real matrices, you do not have the Schur's lemma. It is not possible to do it. Yeah. But you have a theorem which is very close to the Schur's lemma by uh, Wintner Munnagan. And what it says is, you can find, okay, now P is no longer unitary because we are looking at real matrices. We are not asking about unitary transformations. We are talking about P which are orthonormal. Okay? And it turns out, Winter Monaghan theorem says that you can find a P such that this matrix is quasi upper triangular. Now, what do we mean by quasi upper triangular? What we mean is the resulting matrix where this T1, T2, T3, and so on are block matrices. Is that okay? So, you think of the matrix as divided into blocks and these are block matrices. So, with respect to those blocks, it is upper triangular. Okay? And we can say further, the sizes of the blocks are either 1 or 2. The essential idea is that if you have complex roots, it forms a complex conjugate pair. Yeah, And if you have A, A, I think B and minus B, 
be in minus V. Then you should get a complex number and its conjugate. Here you get lambda squared minus 2a lambda plus a squared plus b squared. So minus b squared. No, this is a symmetric matrix. This doesn't make sense. It is minus B. Yeah. This is the characteristic equation. Therefore, the roots are A plus minus the root of B squared. That's 4A squared minus 4 times A squared plus B squared. So you have square root of minus 4b squared divided by 2. Yeah, so what you get will be a plus minus ib. Yeah, or ringing true to my electrical engineering background, jb. Yeah, is that okay? So these blocks, they will either be of this kind, so they give rise to the complex conjugates or they will be size of block 1 which will be the real eigenvalues. Okay, that's, that's what they say. Alright, but where does this all this get us as far as solving, solving uh, the eigenvalue problem is concerned? Hmm? Uh, am I out of time? Nearly? Huh? Ten minutes. Ten minutes? Ten minutes. Okay. So, what we have been told is that uh, there is some unitary matrix by which, the given complex matrix, there is some unitary matrix by which you can convert it into a upper diagonal matrix. We have no idea what this unitary matrix is. Yeah? But given a A, we know there is a QR factorization of A and this R is upper triangular. Right? R is upper triangular. So maybe this Q is a good guess. Yeah? Maybe this Q is a good guess. Right? So what we can do is you take Q conjugate AQ. Okay? Maybe what we'll do is we'll look at an example and see what happens. Okay, let's take some A. Okay, so we have this A. Uh, okay, so that's the Q that we have. And what we could do is B is Q transpose star A star Q transpose. Yeah. So it doesn't look good. We've got something which is not upper triangular. Yeah? Uh, but uh, we can find the QR of this. Yeah? 
Okay? And then we do the same operation on this B. You get a new B. Now if you looked at the old B and this new B, the earlier B was this. You had 0.15 in the extreme southwest and 0.65 and 0.44. If you look at this B, it has become smaller. Yeah? And of course it's smaller than the original A, which was 3, 0 and 1. Huh? So let's let's continue. It has become smaller. Yeah. The three the three one element has become zero, the other two are still doing something. Yeah, now they, it's getting closer and closer. Well, <coughs> it has finally become upper triangular. And then you can look at the diagonal values and say the eigenvalues are 3.732 minus 1 and 0.268. Yeah, I have preserved the A matrix. So just for... Yeah? So it looks like it works. You just keep doing QR, you use that Q and keep multiplying. Yeah, keep doing the transformation and finally you will end up with the eigenvalues. Yeah, finally you will end up with the upper triangular matrix. Looks like it works. Yeah, What you are really doing is you are searching in this unitary group for the correct transformation. And with each iteration, you are in some sense getting to that transformation. Yeah? Why it works is something that's not quite known. Yeah? Why it works is something that's not quite known. Yeah? But it works. You take any big matrix, you can keep doing these things and finally you will end up with a upper triangular matrix. You keep taking QR and keep doing this, it will, yeah. But then, okay, it works good. The problem is that doing this QR factorization is order n cubed. So, this seems like a huge operation. Yeah, it's a huge operation. Take it's too expensive. Yeah. By the way, I hope you know all the TikTok business in MATLAB. Yeah, you know it, right? I mean, tick, and then oh, it has been given in tutorial. That means you haven't worked on your tutorial. Terrible people need to be all. TikTok tells you how much time has elapsed huh? for a for a particular operation. So but this is too small an operation to Too little. Yeah, I mean, and so uh, hundred cross hundred matrix, random matrix, and <laughs> okay, three hundred.
it shows some time. Uh, now uh, it takes 0 0.063 seconds to get a QR of a 300 cross 300 matrix. And how many iterations is not very clear. Yeah, for that small matrix 3 cross 3, we did something like 10, 12 iterations. For the 300 cross 300, it's not clear. So now, what one needs to do is make it. You know that this works, so try and make it more efficient. Yeah, that means you don't want to take too many operations to do your QR factorization. Yeah, but you finally want to converge to a matrix which is upper triangular. Okay, so that's the next thing that we want to do. Now we already know that finding QR is order n cubed. Yeah, but we also said that if you have a upper Hessenberg matrix. The QR factorization can be done in order n squared. So maybe what we do is first convert something into upper Hessenberg and then do QR. Okay? Convert something into upper Hessenberg. So given A, you convert it into upper Hessenberg. Yeah? And then do QR on that. Okay, so given a, a, you first convert it into B, which is upper Hessenberg. So of course this operation will take some time. Okay, then you find QR factorization. Use that Q to obtain the new yeah the new iterate so you have q transpose b q is b1 huh? of course this b1 may not be upper hessenberg yeah, if b1 is a general matrix then we have to again convert to upper hessenberg yeah is that fine? Therefore, rather than what I did, if you have an A and this is the QR factorization of A, yeah, any A, I claim I take these two matrices <coughs> and multiply it in the reverse order. I will get A1, where A1 is equal to what? Q transpose A naught Q, which is what we wanted to do. Why does this work? From this equation, Q transpose A naught equal to R. Put that in here. Okay. What I was doing on the MATLAB just now was I was multiplying three matrices <coughs> for each iteration. I mean, I found QR and then I did this multiplication, which is three matrices were being multiplied to get A1. When you multiply three matrices, how many operations? What's the order? N to the 4. Is that okay? Yeah? But if I do it this way, I save a lot on the operations. So if A naught is QR, I multiply the Q and the R the other way around, I will get the next iterand for whatever algorithm we used. 
Okay? Yeah? And now, suppose A0 was upper Hessenberg. That's upper Hessenberg. This is A naught. Okay? Now I'm I'm going to do a proof by pictures. This is Q. This is R. Yeah? The product of these two is A naught. Therefore, for the first column of A naught, it is the first row magnified by whatever is this non zero element. So, can it be the first column of that is the first column of this? Multiplied? First column of this multiplied by this non zero element. Everything else is zero. Yeah? Which means the first column of Q must look like the first column of. Okay. The second column here has three non zero elements. Everything else is zero. And if you look here, it is obtained by something times the first column of Q plus something times the second column of Q. Which means the second column of Q must be like that. If you take a Hessenberg matrix and find the QR factorization, then that Q must be Hessenberg. Is that okay? Yeah, I hope the proof is clear, I hope. Yeah? This is upper triangular. This is Hessenberg. Yeah? Given A naught, Q is Hessenberg. R is upper triangular. You get A1 by multiplying these two matrices the other way around. Okay. So, next sheet. Upper triangular Hessenberg. The resulting matrix will be The resulting matrix will be Hessenberg. Is that clear? Yeah? Therefore, if you start with the Hessenberg matrix and go through these iterations, take a Hessenberg matrix, find the QR factorization, then do RQ to get the next iterand, that iterand will also be a Hessenberg matrix. Okay? Now this algorithm is what is called the QR algorithm. Please note QR algorithm is different from the QR factorization. This is an algorithm. It's an algorithm that one uses to find the eigenvalues. And this is one step in that algorithm. So one could call this step the QR step. So you keep iterating the QR step several times. Start with the A which is upper Hessenberg. Do the QR step. Of course, it needn't be upper Hessenberg. Yeah? But if you start with upper Hessenberg, you keep each QR step will give rise to another matrix which is also upper Hessenberg. Okay? But finally, it will converge to upper triangular, which means the sub-diagonal elements will slowly become zero. It's like magic. Like magic, yeah. Yeah?
Is that okay? Of course, this QR step can also be done on a general matrix. It doesn't matter. But we do it on an upper Hessenberg matrix because the amount of calculations that need to be done is much lesser on that. Okay? So that is the QR algorithm which we will now discuss for, I guess, several days. Yes, there are lots of things to be done with the QR algorithm. Okay, assignment next Monday by 5.